Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar with Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor, WASUP. I'm Andy Wales. I'm one of the non-exec directors at WASUP, as well as uh, being Chief Digital Impact and Sustainability Officer at BT, a telco firm based in the UK. So welcome to us this afternoon. The WASUP team, as always, in a kind of high impact, high energy way, have quite an incredible array of speakers for us and a lot to get through, uh, looking at this topic of adapting in a time of crisis. And of course, this is a crucial time for this debate after the emergency response last year, and of course, that's continued a bit this year on COVID. Uh, and with vaccines starting to be rolled out in, in some countries anyway, it can be tempting for some of us to think that the crisis may be mainly over. And perhaps if you're reading the press in the UK this morning after the Prime Minister's announcements, you might think that as well. But of course, that's not the case. For many countries, comprehensive vaccination programmes could be years off, if at all, for some of the poorest people in those countries. So we need between us to keep momentum going on the improvements that we need around hygiene provision, giving people the clean water they need, not just for protection against COVID, of course, um, but for dignified living, the goal that we've always been working towards. And of course, COVID is primarily an urban uh, challenge with those living close together in poorly built urban settlements are particularly at risk from COVID. And so in this hour, we're going to hear from a panel of excellent experts who are going to share their insights with what's been happening in the last 12 months in different parts of the world, the very different types of organisations they represent. We will also hear um, just ahead of that from our opening speaker, who's going to give a perspective um, from a water utility in Kenya, live on the ground in terms of what uh, what, what it feels like there, the challenges they've faced and how they're responding. And we'll finish at the end uh, with Neil Jeffrey, who's the CEO of WhatsApp, uh, and we'll be hearing more from him about WhatsApp's plans in the coming months to continue to expand and, and, challenge, and tackle some of the COVID challenges they are facing. So uh, a fair bit to get through in the hour. I hope you find it stimulating and enjoying. Enjoy it. I'm very much looking forward to um, doing it with you. We've got lots and lots of people signed up. I think over 700 people have signed up last night. I think we have um, hundreds probably on now. So why don't we start by engaging you and go straight to a poll. So if we could have the poll up, um, we'd like to know in terms of your initial thoughts um, in the battle against COVID-19, what is the single most important thing we can do to improve um, greater access to clean water, safe sanitation and hygiene? And you can see four answers there. Uh, unfortunately, the host and the panellists can't vote, so you can't hear what I think, but please can you vote, and we'll see your results in a moment. Elizabeth, are we getting some good votes in? Yep, everyone seems to be voting. We've got about um, half the people in. Uh, yep. Let's give, let's give it a few more seconds. Let's see, see where we get to. So we have four options, implement mass hygiene promotion programs, invest in stronger water sanitation and hygiene service providers, make more effective use of technology and improve policies and regulation to eliminate inequalities around wash access. Right, have we got enough in there, Elizabeth? Do you think we can see the results? Yep, I'll show the results now. Brilliant. There we go. Invest in stronger water, sanitation and hygiene providers, uh, which is interesting, is, is quite a long way ahead with 50%, 15, sorry, 29% second improve policies and regulation to eliminate inequalities around wash access. Third, implement mass hygiene promotion campaigns. And fourth, make more effective use of technology. I think we're going to cover different aspects of all of that today, including those, those that scored uh, the, the three highest. So why don't we, if we can then move straight, thank you for that, Elizabeth. Why don't we move straight into looking at uh, having our first speaker. We are very uh, privileged to have with us uh, Gerald Mwambire, who is the uh, CEO of Melindi Water in Kenya. Gerald, could you give us your presentation, talk us through some of the challenges you've faced in the last 12 months and what it's looking like for you looking ahead. Thank you, all the participants. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in this world. I hope I'm audible now enough. Uh, I want to give a perspective, a study of Malindi Water and Sanitation Company 
uh, during this COVID pandemic and the challenge that we've had and how we have waded through. So I'll start this by sharing my screen. Uh, adapting in a time of crisis. Um, first, I'll start the key statistics of Malindi. Malindi, Malindi area, Malindi Water Storage Company covers an area of, of 7,000 kilometers, uh, square kilometers with active connections 32,000 and a staff of 26. As cities grow, so does the water and sanitation service provision challenges. Gerald, sorry to interrupt you. I think we should, forgive me for interrupting you there. I think we're just waiting to see your slides. I don't know if you could try sharing again. Oh, I, I share them again, okay. And if not, maybe the WhatsApp team can show them. And I should say, while we're waiting for Gerald, please do start asking your questions and comments in the chat on the side. We won't be using the Q&A function on Zoom today, but we'll be using the chat. So do, do type your questions there. Brilliant. I think we're there. Gerald, thank you. Back to you. Are we back now? Yeah, we're there. Please, please carry on. Gerald, I could see your slides then. Perfect. Yes, are we there? We're there, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I think uh, I gave the background of, of Malindi Water, a storage company, which uh, our area of coverage is around 7,000 square kilometers, active connection 20, 32,000 and a staff and a staffing of 206 staff. As I said, as cities grow, water and sanitation provision challenges also increase. Um, in all cities, basically around here in Kenya, uh, which Malindi is, is, is have we had similar challenges before COVID. One was, first of all, the water was not inadequate. Our production levels were low. Uh, we are a scarce water country. So our, our water, our, the water is not enough for everybody. Our infrastructure is old. Uh, we call it pre-colonial here, it's 50 years plus. We have had challenges of climate. Uh, our water comes from boreholes. So when it rains, um, when it, we, have, we have floods, the boreholes are washed away. When it's dry, the water is not enough because of climate changes. Then we had enough challenges within the organization. This in terms of building challenges, how do we collect the revenue? Then, as I said, we use our water comes from boreholes. We have a very high cost of energy, makes our water very expensive. Then the other are the normal water, water uh, challenges. This is non driven water is high. Malindi water is trying its level base around 25%, but again, it's quite high. Then staff issues, you know, low morale because there are no working tools, not enough materials. So all these couples were challenging before COVID. Now, when COVID came in, uh, the challenges even became bigger because one, uh, the government issued directives that you know we need to give provide water because because water was was is one of those components that is able to mitigate the extremities of COVID. So when we are giving free water, that means we had low revenue collection, and the companies there are commercialized that they don't get enough subsidies from from the government. So literally, we went, the, the, the companies were almost collapsing. Then the government, the directives on lockdown and curfew, workers could not travel, could not move around. We could not uh, fix the lines. So again, during the COVID, since water is one of the key elements on combating COVID, the in, there was an increase in demand. Um, staff safety became critical because also you have to take care of, of your staff. How do you manage your staff when they go out there, internally and externally, they could they interact with. Then again, 
with the issue of social distance, we had increased, I mean, office space needs became critical. Then basically the other item is how do you communicate with the customers? Initially, the customers used to have walking in, into the organization. Now we have to find ways of communicating with them. How do we meet, how do we, you know, their complaints, how do we solve their problems? So as a company, we, this way, we, we took it as declaration of war. So we formed a war council. How do you manage this? So one of the items was, first of all, is to advocacy, was to tell the government that we have this crisis and what is critical. Because we realized most of the, most of the attention had been given to the health facilities and medical facilities, and water had just been left behind. Nobody actually remembered about water. So we had to form, an ad, we had to create a strong advocacy. Uh, one was for financial assistance and technological support. Then, the other issue was now how do you manage our workers? So our workers, you know, we had to make workers work in shifts because the office space was a challenge. So we created a shifting way how people will come in and some will come in day and night at, so that we're able to manage this service provision. Then also that thing was about an e-communication, radio. We used to have, we use a lot of radio uh, because we have to communicate to our customers, even in terms of building them and they, you know, uh, communication in terms of water rationing and the rest. So we became very strong in the social media platforms and all forms of communication. Then our workforce had to be flexible. You know, with this COVID, you know, even them working in shifts, it needed flexibility. Also going out there to meet people who we really we are not sure about their health well-being, so they have a flexible workforce that is able to adapt to this new reality. Then also in the same breath, also we decided to do a bit of technology adoption in terms of um, SMS billing. And also we started on, on a prepaid metering solution for our customers so that, we, that to minimize that interaction. Then the other issue we realized again is we needed to be strong on the well-being of our workers. We need to protect them. We need to give them PPs, sensitize them because a strong workforce means uh, more productivity for us. Um, so now, what is the future for us as an organization? What is the future facing us in the future? What, what should we do in the future? The way we think as Malindi Water is, first of all, is the workforce flexibility. Our workforce must be able, we must be, uh, we have a workforce that is, first of all, must be learning workforce um, and it's able to adapt to changes immediately and adapt to the way we work. That also means we need to remodel our business process. We need to shorten our processes as a, an organization so that uh, we eliminate a lot of bur bureaucracies. Then in that same breath, you also need to use, we need to, uptake of technology um, where you know workers can work remotely and at a low cost where we're able to use uh, meters for technology and metering billing i mean sms we need we, we need to use technology then lastly this is uh, our thinking as a question is about mitigating measures on climate on climate resilience we have a lot of issues in terms of changes in the climate our water, first of all, is from underground, it's from, it's from boreholes. Then our areas is also prone to flooding. So literally, we need to manage our, the way we work on our climate. We need to come up with measures on how to manage the area. Um, I wish to end it up there for, for the discussion um, so that we're able, this is our case study in Malindi. And uh, we've tried our level best to make sure that we have provided water and up to now we're still providing water within these difficult moments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gerald. And thank you um, not only for sharing such an insightful view of the challenges that you've been facing, the incredible way you and your teams have been dealing with it, um, but also for being the most sharpest and most concise webinar speaker I've had in the last 12 months. So thank you very much. That was excellent and really clear. Um, so we're going to move on now to a panel and I will um, 
come back to Gerald as well during that panel, I think, um, because of the, the experience he's just talked through. Well, let me introduce the panel to you in a second. I would um, first, if I'm allowed to, um, gently, gently um, encourage the panel to be as concise and tight and focused as Gerald was uh, in, your, in your answers, because we have three sets of questions to get through, and we also want to get some of the questions to, uh, from the chat that are, that are coming in. Um, so we have three, uh, four, sorry, uh, fantastic speakers. Jeff Goldberg is Director for the Center for Water Security, Sanitation and Hygiene at USAID. Thank you and welcome, Jeff. Uh, Andrea Jones is the Program Officer for International Programs at the, uh, the Hilton Foundation. Great to have you with us, Andrea. Frank Ketty is the Program Manager for Ghana for What's Up. And Helena Dolimore is from Unilever and Senior Manager in the Global Sustainability Team. So we, you can see we have across um, development organizations, uh, foundations, uh, WASAP's own teams around the world, and from the private sector, some leaders in all of those spaces who all work with WASAP and can give, I think, a pretty good view of the challenges they see and also uh, what they've learned in their projects working with WASAP. So why don't we start, if we can, on the topic of innovation, uh, one of the, you know, the key uh, things that interested me when I first heard about WASAP probably more than 10 years ago. Uh, this year's all been about change. We've been scrambling to adjust to new working practices, uh, new priorities, new pressures. They've been constantly changing in the context of COVID. So despite some of the challenges there, we've also seen some positives. And it'd be really interesting to learn from you. What have you seen um, that's really positive? Uh, what, what have you learned from it that you think we can take forward? And Jeff, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, absolutely. And just to, to kick off, I want to uh, thank What's Up for uh, convening us all. Um, thank my colleague Gerald from Melindy Water for the, the great presentation and just really great to, to convene and, and discuss this today. I think just to kick off, I want to situate um, USAID's programming relative to that, that question, if it's all right. Um, so our Water for the World uh, initiative is really looking at adapting uh, to crises in our water and sanitation programming writ large. I mean, I think you don't have to look much further than the past year with COVID to know that, you know, that is kind of the ultimate shock, but in many ways, it's just the dress rehearsal for uh, what is going to be our new normal with climate change moving forward. So just, you know, want to affirm our commitment at USAID to working with uh, governments, utilities, partners uh, on these issues moving forward and, and just noting that this, this affects all of us um, as well. It's an issue both domestically and abroad. But in terms of overall innovation, I mean, I think one thing in reflecting upon this question that we um, have noted and seen in our programming is really kind of a, a leapfrogging effect on some uh, aspects of utility efficiency that we'd been trying to make inroads at uh, for many years. And kind of chief among those is digital and digital payments. So with the need to socially distance uh, and like my colleague Gerald was mentioning, kind of adapt workplace flexibilities uh, that are sensitive to COVID and the pandemic, we've seen uh, leaps and bounds, kind of uh, an acceleration of digital payments uh, through some of our programming. So for example, in Nigeria, we have a large investment uh, called the Effective Wash Program, eWash. Uh, and in Niger State, we have worked with the State Water Board to adopt to digital payments. And we've done similar work in Haiti um, over the past 10 months. And I think we've seen that take place at a rate that you know, has really kind of just eclipsed uh, this discussion on digital payments that we've been having for the better part of the, the past decade. So you know, I think in many ways, uh, COVID has been a forcing event to look uh, at how we can derive um, not only a safe environment for um, our utilities, but to enact some of the efficiencies that we are seeking to, um, to move forward towards any way that we know are critical to building resilient water and sanitation utilities. So Got it. Uh, I think that's, that's my kind of principal reflection there that uh, we've seen an acceleration on, on digital. Thank you, Jeff. And it's, I mean, really interesting, of course, because digital has been long coming to the water and sanitation space, but, but suddenly accelerated, I guess, in this context. And yet, at the, at the poll of the start of this um, start of this webinar, of course, digital came last, I think. And so it might, that might be a good bit of tension and discussion for the end of this end of this webinar in terms of with the attendees. Um, so thank you very much for that. It'd be great if we could now go, Helena, to get a private sector view on that. What, what have you seen that's positive and, and um, what would you be taking forward? Yeah, thanks, Andy, and, and thanks again to, to WUSUP and, and the team for convening us. I think it's such an important issue and great to see so many people joining the webinar as well. 
Um, I think Andy, as you as you mentioned at the beginning, obviously having good access to wash and accompanying that good hygiene behaviour is vital in both the fight against COVID-19, but also the fight against many other diseases. Um, and I think we strongly believe that this is something that's only going to become more important as we face new threats like climate change and, and potentially in the future, new diseases. Um, and for us, really, there's two main elements to improving hygiene. Um, both of which I think we've seen some really exciting innovations during um, the last couple of months from our partners. First, you've got to have access. Um, you know, you can't wash your hands if you live in the world's largest refugee camp where there are simply not enough places to access water to wash your hands. Um, but secondly, once you've provided the infrastructure, we also know that behaviour change, change is absolutely key. So, you know, many of us may, may have heard about programmes where Hand washing stations are set up by donors um, and then because nobody tells people how to use the hand washing stations, the program leaves and then those hand washing stations are not maintained and they're abandoned. So for us, it's really key that that both those areas are considered in this. Um, Unilever, we, you know, we're a big soap company. We have a really long history in this area. Um, some of the panelists uh, may be aware of it, but we were founded back in the 19th century with the vision of making cleanliness commonplace. And we've built on that heritage ever since through many of our hygiene brands, soap brands like Lifebuoy, Domestos, which is a bleach brand, they work on a number of different wash partnerships um, and have already reached over a billion people with things like educating school children on how to wash your hands, improving access to toilets in schools. So really when the pandemic struck, we knew that there was a lot we could do to help the response. Um, and we decided to work with the UK government in response to the pandemic. We brought together our strengths as a company that knows a lot about hygiene and knows a lot about how to make people practice good hygiene behaviour. We brought that together with the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the Foreign Office in the UK, previously DFID, um, and a number of partners, one of which was WUSUP, um, and also 20 other UN NGO partners, and we call it the Hygiene and Behaviour Change Coalition. So for us, that's our kind of big innovation during the pandemic, but we've seen a huge range of different activities going on um, as part of that coalition. And I just want to talk about a couple of them to give you an insight into those innovations. So one of the big issues that we had at the beginning um, was of course, that not everyone in the world right now has access to a place to wash their hands safely or clean water. So we knew that if we were going to curb the spread of COVID-19 in those places and truly leave nobody behind, we needed to make sure that there were approaches, programs that were reaching those vulnerable groups. So we have a number of partners that are working, you know, specifically to reach refugees, specifically to target approaches to support people with disabilities. You know, for example, making sure that hand washing stations are at the right height um, or interpreting mass awareness campaigns on public health in sign language so that everyone can access them. Um, and the other problem we found was that, you know, many NGOs, WUSUP is one, but, but many others in the sector as well, are used to running programming often, which relies on interpersonal behavior, you know, going door to door, working through a health clinic, working in a school, working in a community setting like that. And we know that in a lockdown, which much of the world was, was put into last year, that just wasn't allowed. It wasn't possible and it wasn't safe either. So what we've been doing with the members of the coalition is really working with NGOs um, to help them find a way of adapting their work to this kind of digital global world that we now live in. Um, and in a pandemic, that means getting messaging out about COVID-19 through mass media, through TV, through radio, and of course, digital, um, as Jeff's just mentioned, to, to get those messages out. Um, and, and we, as a, as a company that specializes in marketing and, and changing behavior, we supported those NGOs with our best kind of agencies and, and marketing experts to help them really target that messaging to the right people in the right way to help them reach it. Um, and, you know, several examples from our work, but I just want to mention um, the one that WUSUP did, where WUSUP are working in Kenya to tackle COVID-19 as part of the Hygiene and Behaviour Change Coalition. And they worked with water utility companies um, who have huge customer databases um, with contact details and, and crucially mobile numbers um, so that they can contact customers. And they use those channels by working with those companies to spread messaging about COVID-19 and what people needed to do to keep safe. We've got other partners who adapted apps that they already had um, to include messaging about COVID-19. Um, even some partners using WhatsApp 
to really spread the message. So lots of examples about, you know, how people adapted what they were doing for the for the digital world we're living in with the expertise and the insights that, that we brought as a business. Um, and I just want to also show everyone um, a campaign that we developed as part of this effort. Um, you know, we were talking to many NGOs and they were finding they had to adapt their work to communicating with people in this way. Um, and this isn't something that NGOs are used to doing. It's something that isn't their kind of usual expertise. So we brought together many of our best agencies to create a global COVID prevention mass media campaign. And those of you who are in the UK, you will be familiar with the hands, face, space campaign that we have in the UK. This is a global version of that hands, face, space, surface. Um, and we've already translated it into over 20 languages. It's on channels from radio to TV to social media to billboards. Um, and we've also had some great examples of um, partners who have adapted this campaign to make it more accessible. You know, really ensuring that you leave no one behind, such as, you know, in Indonesia, um, SNV have adapted it so that there's sign language interpretation over the TV advertisement. Um, or in Kenya, um, we have a partner who's included puppets in the representation of the campaign to really engage children in this. So loads of examples through the HBCC of how people have been innovating during COVID. And I think one of the things we're now working on and, and keen to hear from the other panelists and the audience about is how to really maintain this momentum and, and take some of the learnings that we've had from the last couple right. of months. Helen, thank you so much for that. And it's great to see the acceleration in, in Unilever's investment in this space uh, and the height, you know, the real, you've been doing a massive amount already on hygiene, but the real expansion of that, which is really exciting. Um, I should say uh, there is a lot of energy and debate going on in the chat. Um, Gerald, to add to his credibility as a, as a kind of concise early speaker, has also been fully answering pretty much every question I can see. So thank you, Gerald, for doing that. Others, feel feel free to jump in. Um, why don't we move to, to Frank and hear what it's been like for WhatsApp in Ghana in the last year, Frank. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, and thank you to all the other panelists. I think um, just to start off from where, uh, what's telling mentioned for instance regarding sustainability of um, the HBCC work to drive hygiene as a practice for um, COVID-19 and of course for increased practice. Um, one thing we did of course with a focus on the front end where we did a message dissemination tailoring message to vulnerable group but at the back end where we really focused was how do you make sure for instance the example that Helen provided with hand wash stations where organizations put them in, they leave them, and then of course, you don't have water filling them, and then of course, you have them going bad over time. How do we work with the utilities? How do we work with the cities to make sure that there are responsibilities for maintaining these hand wash stations? There are responsibilities for making sure these hand wash stations are refilled for people to be able to use. Of course, you make it easier for people to change behavior when they have access to um, the hand wash stations and the water they have to. Um, wash their hands. I think this was just uh, to add up to what Helen was saying, but key to it, of course, I want to come to what we have been doing with uh, the utilities, for instance. Of course, for WhatsApp, our key focus is how do we empower the utilities to be able to respond and effectively um, support sanitation and water and hygiene service delivery of our work. So what we've been doing, of course, was to look at, at the outset of the pandemic, apart from the message uh, messaging that we were doing with the support from the HPCC campaign. We also then looked at it and uh, planned how do we make sure we are able to critically look at decisions coming out from government, how they impact um, the utilities, not the operations in the interim, but the operations overall and in the long term. And where we looked at, of course, in Ghana, generally, just as in other um, locations, you had the issue of free water, government providing free water to um, citizens. So overall, the issue was how do we work with the utilities to be able to make sure they are not adversely impacted by this directive in the long term. Of course, looking at it, once you realize that the key focus areas was what was the government directive and its impact overall. And in Ghana, uh, contrast to the situation in Malindi, where Gerard uh, pointed out, the government decided to absorb the cost for this water uh, free water provision for the utilities, even though they were not going to readily have the funds available to them when they needed them, the funds were going to be released to them over time. 
So how we looked at it was how was the government expecting this reimbursement to be done and how can we as WhatsApp support these utilities to be able to respond to that? It was relatively simpler for the bigger utility that is the Ghana Water Company Limited because the premise was on data. What data have you collected on water use within the communities? Whilst it was relatively simpler for the bigger utility as Ghana Water Company Limited, it was not the same for small time rural water management systems, for instance, where they lack the capacity to be able to collect accurate data on water use on system types and all that. So what we did was to work with um, the Community Water and Sanitation Agency, the regional office, for instance, to be able to look at how do we make sure for the locations that we're working, how do we make sure we guide community management systems, community management scheme to be able to know what data they needed to collect and how are they able to also make sure they get these funds reimbursed by government. And this has been a key part. And of course, one key thing, whilst in terms of the message delivery and all, um, technology has driven a lot of it, you know, electronic media has driven a lot of it. Data has also been realized as a key component in terms of driving utility performance um, in the future. And this is not only in respect to customer data base, but looking at location data, spatial data for systems that are put in to be able to make sure there's a regular monitoring of these um, systems that are put in and they are able to function sustainably. I think one key part also in looking at it, apart, as part from the capacity building and all, was to look at the effect on willingness to pay. Because whilst all these directives from government is ongoing, we only look at it from uh, at the impact in the interim as to what financial challenges are um, happening uh, to the utilities. But in the long term, we planned and discussed with the utilities, a lot of work has gone into encouraging and improving willingness to pay, especially in low income communities. And these directives, though it will be short lived, um, these directives are going to have long term impact, especially in the context of Ghana, for instance, where you have uh, predominantly most customers on um, postpaid payment systems. You are going to have a system where after these directives, even though people are supposed to pay, they are, there's going to be a backlog of areas that people wouldn't be able to pay because they feel the services have to be provided for free. Got so it. as part Great. of that, we... So I was going to say thank you for that. I think we'll come back to that issue when we get on to the next section, if that's okay. So if you don't mind, thank you very much. That's um, a set of really interesting insights on the, there in Ghana. Could we perhaps move to Andrea? Andrea, perhaps we could, perhaps you could talk, talk about innovation, but also looking forwards and bridge to the next discussion, which is going to be about strong utilities and help us think how you can take that innovation forward um, to what utilities help, you know, how utilities might be able to strengthen in the coming months. Thanks, Andy, and thank you, Wasab, for having me. I think that's exactly right. Uh, the other panelists talked about how innovation has been used, whether it's digital technology or behavior change and the like to respond to COVID. But more so, I would think what has COVID shown is that there's a lot of gaps within the WASH systems that still need to be addressed and technology innovations could be further developed and used to help address those gaps. So specifically thinking about administering targeted safety nets and subsidies that ensure water supply is available for the most vulnerable, but doesn't compromise the financial viability of utilities. We heard Gerald and Frank talk about how governments have put in place different policies such as the free water mandate, which has been important and needed for IPC purposes and ensuring vulnerable populations have means to wash their hands. But these blanket safety net approaches have put service providers in a financially precarious situation, taking on lots of debt and not necessarily a clear pathway for reimbursement. And so for us at the Hilton Foundation that has a particular focus on ensuring the most vulnerable are served, we will be looking at ways in which we can use and develop technologies and innovations such as machine learning approaches, satellite imagery to better identify, well, who is actually vulnerable, who could benefit from a subsidized service, and then with that, administering targeted subsidy programs. Um, Jeff mentioned the use of digital technology in the sense of payment schemes. Well, these provide the infrastructure in place to be thinking about, well, how do you offer a subsidized service for those at a household connection or perhaps electronic cards at water ATMs? 
And so thinking about the use of technology and identifying vulnerable people, um, deploying these, uh, these different subsidy programs, I think are gonna be increasingly more important, uh, particularly as it looks to how do you use that to control more spending? As it relates to ensuring equitable services, how do you help utilities still earn revenue? So not cutting off that revenue where it still is, yet ensuring households have equitable access when they need it in a time of crisis, but also beyond. Got it. No, thank you, Andrew. That I think that's one of the most fundamental issues that's come up already. Gerald, a number of the questions in the chat were asking you about uh, free water, the, the financial position. Uh, of your organization and your, and your peers in the context of, of that challenge. Do you have anything further to add on that? Uh, the, the Kenyan government really gave a directive to provide free water to the vulnerable, but again, there was no reciprocal funding for the same. So in part of advocacy, um, we talked to through many multilateral organization, NGOs, and some of them have funded us with chemicals, at least to improve the, I mean, the service delivery. But the government was really trying, but I think it's cash trap, it could not make that. So this also has made the utilities collapse to financial. What does that, what does that mean for utilities financial resilience going forward? Um, now, you see now, uh, we need to find better ways of collecting this revenue now from these people. That's why we are most of it is now we are moving into adopting or prepaid metering. Okay, which which of course you know is, is a subject of debate and challenge in, in different parts yes. of the world as well. Um, Jeff, perhaps can we could turn to you? I don't know, you may have a, a view on that as well, um, and it would also be good to understand a bit more. I know you've been working with WhatsApp in Madagascar, so you may have lessons from, from there or elsewhere around how you think utilities can be strengthened. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm just watching some of the, the questions in the, the chat box too. So I'll try and weave a couple things together here. But, um, you know, as the other panelists have mentioned, I mean, we're really seeing utilities and service providers kind of at the brink uh, in terms of kind of this very tricky challenge of having to weigh the provision of water for IPC uh, in an emergency context versus looking at the longer term sustainability and financial health uh, and ability to deliver these services over the long term. And I see that there was a question about water scarcity and climate variability. So, I mean, just kind of to add that into the mix, you know, we know that 90% of water of disasters um, that have occurred over the better course of the past decade are water related in nature. Um, that's too much uh, flooding or too little droughts, and that this is acutely compounding what is already uh, kind of just the ultimate shock with, with COVID. So you know, when we're looking at helping utilities adapt, it's really a combination of uh, working hand in hand on some back to basics fundamentals of uh, ensuring appropriate cost recovery and making sure that short term that we're looking beyond these short term subsidies to make sure uh, that utilities are able to serve customers with emphasis on the poor and vulnerable like Andrea was mentioning mentioning, but then also looking at how we integrate climate services and climate change considerations into the operations of these utilities so you know, one example um, that is a good one from our suite of programming is work in the Philippines on integrating climactic data into decision making for water source protection uh, by utilities across the Philippines and actually providing real time data so that they are able to target and tailor source water protection efforts to ensure raw water supply um, in a changing climate and then you know, not to be forgotten is sanitation as well. Um, in the Dominican Republic, some of our work, I mean, as is the case across the board uh, where we're working with um, uh, non-safely managed sanitation with open sewers and in the face of floods, uh, there's risk of environmental ha health contamination. We've been doing a lot of work on nature-based solutions and making sure that there are um, natural buffers to be able to absorb in the, the urban environment uh, some of these contaminants that put communities at risk. So really we're trying to take a holistic approach that looks at financial health, but it, that is also integrating uh, climate sensitive approaches, whether that's through data or actual nature-based solutions uh, to build resilience uh, to these shocks that are only gonna keep coming over time. 
thank you. And I mean, there's some really good questions linked to that in the chat, including from Baggy Bangarithan, which has talked about um, that, that challenge around, around water scarcity, flooding, natural disasters, and whether it needs to be linked to a broader urban resilience agenda. Um, I don't know, Andrew, if you wanted to comment on that one. And the broader climate challenge, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is another area that has been illuminated by COVID. Us at the Hilton Foundation have been placing an intentional effort to think about sustainable water planning and management services at a municipality level. So what needs to be in place in terms of capacity tools and planning? And I would say due to COVID, there has been natural shocks within the system in which we've realized resiliency hasn't necessarily been at the forefront. But I would say working at the municipality level, it does provide an opportunity in which to convene all stakeholders across all sectors to plan out for resiliency. So how do you start thinking about disaster risk management plans, um, resiliency plans within the overall planning processes? I think secondly, what type of coordination mechanisms also need to be in place at that level? Um, we talked around resiliency in terms of the health systems, for instance, they're a big part of the demand for water usage, and they face a lot of the same problems that we've been talking about in terms of climate change and how that's going to impact their ability to deliver on quality of care in IPC. So thinking about what coordination mechanisms need to occur to understand the full demands. And I would say thirdly, what type of data infrastructure needs to be in place to fully understand what are the different risks and hazards in terms of developing infrastructure? We talk about um, what is the market size, what is the economics, but maybe not as much is just as important, but what are the environmental risks and hazards in which could impact the shelf life and the asset life uh, for different communities. And so for us at the Hilton Foundation, we've actually been really keen on working with service providers to develop a comprehensive planning tool that brings in GIS analytics, risks analysis, as well as resilience modeling and it's a tool in which service providers can use to look at their service area to understand what are the full hazards and risks. And then based on particular decisions that they make, how does it actually increase resiliency? So having this type of data at the onset to inform planning um, versus going in and then having to retrofit or the aging of infrastructure and the like, I would say that's gonna be crucial going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And um, one of the questions that's come in from Alana Kona, who I think is GSMA, has been uh, from GSMA, um, is around what evaluations have taken place on uh, the adoption and impact of digital solutions in, in um, those kind of challenging urban areas. Um, I don't know if we can come to you, um, Helena, to ask both about climate and the role of the private sector in, in tackling kind of climate related water scarcity issues, but also if you can comment on, on any evaluations you've seen on the adoption of digital technology to address that. Yeah, thanks. I think it's a really interesting question about digital, the use of digital. Um, I think something we found during the pandemic is that obviously it became a necessity to reach people through ways that that didn't involve that physical contact, which became dangerous. But there's definitely, you know, a, a discussion to be had and, and I think more evidence needed about how well do digital methods reach the most vulnerable. Um, you know, we know that the people who often don't have access to a smartphone, um, they're often women, they're often people living in poverty um, and, and different groups. It's, it's the same inequalities we see played out in other spaces, essentially. There is that digital gap. Um, so I think it's key that, that that is looked at, but for us, it's been a key part of the solution. Um, I think certainly looking at the evaluations that have been done as part of HBCC, there's clear evidence in terms of the number of people who've been reached. And also it's not just, you know, um, you can't, just as you can't put a sign up by the sink, you know, when we used to go to the office saying, please wash your hands and people will do it. It's the same with digital. You need to design really smart, clever, targeted campaigns 
Um, and that's some of the expertise that we've tried to bring to the coalition to, to make sure things are done in a smart way rather than just a simple message communicated um, right. using games and, and other tools. And then on, on climate, I think, you know, that's absolutely a massive challenge for the world. I think there's a saying that people talk about climate change. If, if climate change were a shark, then water would be the teeth of it, because that's how we as, as the human population are going to feel the consequences and already are many, many countries are already seeing those impacts. Um, something that, you know, we're obviously working with significantly reduced water usage in our own operations, but we're also reaching out and working with groups like um, the Water Resources Group um, to re reduce stress in particular kind of key markets where there's a big water stress. Um, and also at the other end, you know, our products are used by consumers. Um, so looking at how we can develop new products that use less water, um, laundry soap that doesn't need as many rinses, it just needs two buckets to be rinsed instead of one, um, dry shampoo doesn't need any water at all. Um, and even in Cape Town, where obviously they've had a lot of issues, the Domestos has developed a toilet spray, which means you don't have to flush the toilet, again, saving water. So I think there's a lot the private sector can do in that area. Yeah, thank you. That's fascinating. I must admit, I had not heard the non-flush toilet spray. I'll go and see if I can investigate that one. That's, that's really interesting. Um, Frank, can we turn to you? There's a couple of questions. One is around climate. What it, you know, I know Ghana has been less affected perhaps than some other African countries in terms of immediate climate change, but but interesting to get your views on, on preparing for adaptation. And then there was a really interesting question as well, uh, which came in around, will water utilities exit the pandemic weaker or stronger, do you think? You know, is there some of this learning and... and um, what we've been talking about, will that enable utilities to, to go forward more strongly or will the financial challenges and others that they face, um, that was from Joe, um, will that will that actually um, you know, make it much more challenging, Frank? Thank you, Andy. I think um, on climate, of course, Ghana has not been as impacted as other um, areas in Africa, but um, in the spirit of um, not leaving anyone behind, of course, once we are trying to put in systems, we want to make sure that these systems are resilient. And that is where um, we work with cities and stakeholders, for instance, to make sure systems that are being put in uh, climate resilient system. There's actually um, not, um, noted uh, report in Ghana, for instance, where com some communities in northern Ghana um, that were declared open unification free have rolled, up, rolled back these gains because of floods. And that's as a result of using um, materials that are not climate resilient. So when these floods happened, their, their facilities were destroyed. So I think that is the first point in terms of even putting in the system, how do you work with cities to take this serious and make sure systems are, that are developed are climate resilient. Of course, um, Helen talked about the judicious use of water, which actually has been part of our campaign even for, that, for our HDCC work, where the free water um, directive let people to use a lot more water. There was a lot more demand for water. So as part of our campaign, there was um, a campaign for judicious use of water, which should be part of our community engagement work overall. We also are planning to work, for instance, with the Ghana uh, Water Resource Commission, for instance, in looking at the proliferation of uh, independent and private boreholes, which of course has an effect on groundwater um, in, in, in Ghana. So these are areas that we are looking at in terms of, uh, from the point of regulation, how do you make sure these are well regulated and in a manner that is safe? I think one example that I'll share, for instance, for the, uh, from the climate perspective is in Kenya, which I feel is an interesting example where they are considering the um, sponge cities, for example, in Nakuru, where uh, Kenya office is working with um, the city authorities, for instance, in creating uh, sponge cities to be able to make sure they are able to uh, prevent um, floods and make sure they, they capture water storage uh, in those locations. So I think those are some of the examples I want to share on climate. Um, of course, it has a huge impact. So how do we work with communities? And it has to be all involving, all stakeholders must be um, involved in making sure we move this forward. On the question of whether, um, how utilities will emerge from the pandemic, uh, I feel at the moment, of course, we, um, utilities have been weakened, but I feel they would emerge taking a lot of lessons from this. I believe the role that water utilities play are too crucial for them to go down. So all stakeholders, including governments who made these decisions, of course, in the right frame of their understanding, 
as to how they should proceed with the free water directive. But I feel water utilities are very important and critical. They provide critical service. So even though they are hugely impacted by these directives and the pandemic overall, I feel there are a lot of lessons. Example, you see the issues around um, digitization and the issues around technology, around data. How do we make sure you know your customers? How are you able to connect to your system to all? And these are key lessons that I feel the utilities are really learning. And in, the, in that respect, I feel they would emerge stronger from these um, less lessons. They, are, they would be impacted financially by the directive. But overall, I feel they would know the lessons, they will know the way forward, and they will feel, and, uh, they will feel stronger at the end of it all. So. Thank you, Frank. There's an interesting comment from Paul Bloating, who's the, uh, the Lord, Lord Paul Bloating, the chair of WhatsApp, actually. Let's, in the chat, let's not underestimate the, uh, the shock Africa faces from a new debt crisis that will hit public and private sectors. WhatsApp can help, uh, help utilities learn, manage risk in large infrastructure projects, but mature markets and development agencies need to step up to the plate as partners in making the necessary investments and, and mobilizing finance. Jeff, perhaps slightly obviously pivoting to you on that question. And also there was a really interesting comment for, or question from Richard Wilson in the chat, stay, talking on, on the, con, you know, not, not a respiratory pandemic, but around neglected tropical diseases and the extent to which the USAID uh, announced a, a billion people impacted by those um, diseases in relation to inadequate wash. And so it'd be great to get your view overall on, on the funding as this, this debt crisis grows potentially and how it links to uh, broader issues such as neglected tropical diseases. Yeah, thank you to, to Paul for that comment. And that's something that um, we've been thinking a lot about internally and definitely aware of this kind of broader macroeconomic uh, context uh, that all of these uh, infrastructure and service delivery investments are situated within. At the risk of something overly simplistic, I think just given that we're limited for time, I mean, I think it, for, for us, it really boils down to that um, kind of as our colleague Gerald uh, outlined at the beginning in his presentation, even before the pandemic, uh, these utilities um, across the board were um, kind of in varying levels of kind of uh, financially precarious positions. And we were already working together as a community to provide technical assistance uh, across governance, credit worthiness for utilities to be able to attract public and private finance. And I think if anything, uh, kind of glass half full wise is that this has really shown a light on the imperative of doing that not only for just mobilizing private capital but just for the solvency and financial health of these utilities so I mean I walk away from kind of reflecting up upon the past year a bit glass half full because I think a lot of the um, this is exactly what Frank was just saying the issues that we have been discussing and the fundamentals of financially sound utilities are just all the more apparent. I think it's um, mainstreamed even more in our dialogue uh, with people who may not otherwise be uh, inclined towards thinking about uh, infrastructure or service delivery finance. And I think it's just fundamental to making sure that we don't actually backslide in terms of access to, to wash services and the ability to practice hygiene uh, in health shocks like COVID-19 or uh, in forthcoming and current climate crises. So I'm a little glass half full in the sense that I think we have the opportunity uh, to kind of look at the fundamentals of good governance, policy, uh, cost recovery, and making sure that we build financially solvent utilities that can withstand any kind of crisis moving forward. And I think we've got a good dialogue in the sector uh, to be able to do that now. Um, so yeah, that, that is my pithy uh, kind of quick response on that, but certainly I think that's something we could discuss uh, and should be discussing at length as a sector moving forward. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to take forward. Perhaps I can take that and, and set a challenge to the rest of the panelists because we're running out of time now for the panel. In, in one sentence, how, how, what it, how are you feeling going forwards about WASH in the context of the, the, the slow recovery from COVID? And to give you a slightly more thinking time, I'll, I will say mine, which is um, encouraged by the level of innovation that I've heard about today. But we, we've already heard from Jeff, you heard from me. Perhaps could we go to you, Helena? And then we'll go around. In one sentence, how are you feeling about it? In one sentence, I am excited, but also nervous that we continue to sustain the momentum that we've had during the pandemic for WASH and keep that going as we come out of it. Got it. No, that's a really good tight one. Thank you. Gerald, could we come to you? Are you able to provide one sentence? I'm so critical in managing of pandemics and I believe for 
the good have the people think government should come in instead of private I'm leaving it to the private sector so a bigger role the government needs to step in and play a bigger role thank you andrea i would say there's a leadership opportunity to build on these lessons to take it forward and drive this agenda thank you really really focused that makes sense and frank yes thank you i think in one sense i'll say i see an opportunity for whatsapp We were doing so well. I think that's a very tight sentence there, Frank, an opportunity for WhatsApp. That's great. And, and forgive me, you've frozen. So on that note, uh, opportune note, and, and, and the connection is very good until now. Why don't we um, move over to Neil, the CEO of WhatsApp, to tell us about the opportunity for WhatsApp, the challenges that you face and, and how you're thinking about this going forward. Neil. Great. Superb, Andy. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Um, and Andy, thank you for your astonishingly skillful um, chairing of, of the event. So I have the invidious task, I think, in about three minutes to try and sum up uh, some of the lessons for WhatsApp. So um, I won't reiterate everything that's said, but I will draw upon various of the points that various speakers made, because it was a really rich and, and powerful discussion. I think um, the conversation today has really reminded us um, of the relevance of WASH in COVID-19, but also the role that WASH can play uh, in building back better and trying to find solutions uh, in the COVID and post-COVID situation. So um, panelists talked about uh, the issue of innovation. A number of them discussed the question of uh, digital communication, how, how important it's become, how useful that's been in terms of getting messaging out. Uh, and then Jeff focused very, much, very heavily on the fact that we've been able to move forward in that question. I mean, the thing that I wanted to uh, bring out in terms of WhatsApp's work was um, that our ability to achieve impact through digitalization and using digital communication was really based on the back of many years of long-term work of building relationships with utilities. Um, but also Helena raised the question of, well, does digitalization reach the poorest? Well, because of all of our work to build um, digital platforms that were connected directly to low-income customers, so if you think about the low-income units that we built with Nairobi Water, with Lusaka Water, they, of course, were gathering all of this kind of information specifically for low-income customers. So it was at exactly through those networks that we were able to then um, create messaging through the Hygiene and Behaviour Change uh, Coalition, which obviously Helena described uh, as UK government and uh, Unilever backed. And, and it, was, it was on the back of those many years of hard graft that we had the opportunity, therefore, to reach the poorest. And I think that's the message that I want to reiterate is that, um, as, as Jess said, COVID has shone a light on the fact that we need to continue to focus on the long term work. On the, um, on the systems change and the building, um, the, ability, the capacity of utilities so that they are able to continue um, to, uh, to serve the poorest and, and we can have greater equity in terms of service provision. Of course, to do that, we need stronger utilities. That was the second point that, that speakers focused on. And all of the um, continuing work to ensure that financial sustainability of utilities are, uh, are continued to be strengthened is essential. It is uh, one of the questions that we have focused on for many years. We have a, a utility strengthening framework that drives all of our work through this. And Jeff, thank you for your, uh, your highlighting of this particular issue. And I would say that I think the role of government is essential uh, in terms of ensuring that this is a priority. It was, um, it was always in the background, but it was never a, a clearly articulated priority and we, we need it to be central. Um, I would say um, that you can't move now on uh, um, uh, on advertising for the word hygiene. I think hygiene is probably connected to every single product in the world. We need financial stability to be as uh, clearly uh, up there in terms of the agenda as an issue that, um, that institutions are pushing. So we need governments to see this as a priority, but also the financial models um, that would allow blended service provision to high income and low income customers uh, need to be in there. And I saw that in, in some of the chat. Um, and then finally, um, um, obviously, the speakers discussed the issue of climate change. And for WhatsApp, climate change is becoming more and more business as usual. We are seeing it everywhere in, term, in terms of our work. So the speakers recognize quite correctly that 
as climate change is making, meaning we have too much water in some locations and too little in others. So we have floods in Bangladesh, we have droughts in Zambia, and that's becoming a standard part of our work. Um, so if we think about um, particular weather events, WASP had to deal with the impact of Cyclone Ida uh, in Mozambique two years ago. Uh, this essentially completely destroyed the, um, the uh, infrastructure in, in Beda. And then as part of our response, we had to help the city think about how would they incorporate Build Back Better uh, and, uh, and enhancing that utility into their uh, urban planning. So for us, we need to work with cities to ensure that adaptation to climate change becomes a standard um, um, uh, process within uh, the response to city resilience. So to wrap up, I would say all of those aspects are essential. We need to recognize that the COVID pandemic is not over. It's gonna be, be with us. And despite the fact in certain countries, we have positive news, uh, I was personally impacted by this. Uh, I was lucky enough to have my COVID jab um, this morning. Um, but in countries in Africa, uh, this vaccination may not occur until 2022 or 2023. So we need to be here to work alongside those utilities and city authorities to ensure that they can respond uh, to this situation. So thank you everybody for a fascinating conversation and uh, back over to you, Andy. Thank you, Neil. What's up? I think is very proud to deliver impact on time and my clock has just ticked over to the hour. So let us finish there. Let me say, first of all, thank you uh, to all the speakers. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Gerald. And thank you to the excellent panel. Um, some really good insights, I thought, then we got into some very specific pieces, which I thought was really interesting and useful. Thank you to the many people who've joined, um, not just to, to listen, but also to get involved in the debate on the chat. Um, and we're just hearing Nova Scotia, Bangladesh, a whole range of places where people are typing in from. So great, great to, to have joined you. Um, I think that it's being recorded, so I think that will be made available. And uh, it's up to me just to wish you a very good lunchtime, evening or breakfast, wherever you are. So thank you very much for joining us.